You are Gwen Kenny, award-winning interior designer. I am, and you are Richard Sloan, MD of Sonus Bathrooms. I am. And between myself and Gwen, we're going to have a conversation with you about planning your bathroom. Uh, just a little bit about Sonus Bathrooms. We are an Irish-owned company. We were established back in 1978, so vast wealth of experience between all the members of the team. Uh, the Sonus brand was originally launched in 2004. We offer a complete bathroom product solution, so full suite offering for all the components that you will need. And we sell our products through a network of retailers across the country, both north and south. A little bit about you. We expect that you're probably not a trade professional. You probably don't design a bathroom very often. You probably have lots of design decisions to make and probably have lots of questions to answer. So you've definitely come to the right place. So Gwen, I'm going to maybe ask you to take us through your kind of brief around planning the design of a bathroom from the perspective of an interior designer. So I suppose the first thing I always ask for is a brief, um, which is drawing everything together and deciding what the rules of the game are, if you like. So what type of bathroom are you designing? Is it a family bathroom? Is it a WC? Is it an ensuite? Uh, who are the users of the bathroom? And what do they represent? So if you have children, everybody wants a bath because they have children, but the kids grow up very quickly. Um, they probably grow out of a bath within a year and maybe a smaller bath would do. And people sometimes end up with a smaller shower and a large bath that isn't used that much. So it's about thinking about those things. Plumbing layout is also important. So if it's a, a renovation, where are your wastes now? Where are your supplies? Can they be changed? How does that work? Um, and then your system as well, your water system is important as well if it's pumped and how you get the, the hot water to things and for the taps and things like that and then your time frame so your products are always in stock so there's no issue there but there is on other things so really figuring out that time frame what the lead times are and stuff that you're putting in excellent so today we're going to talk about first fix considerations wall home vanity units different types of toilets believe it or not there are more than one concealed or exposed showers wet room or shower tray showers all the decisions that you need to make a bath or not lighting storage accessories universal design or future proofing hidden costs and we're going to go through some common mistakes as well yeah. so there's a huge amount at play when it comes to designing a bathroom and there are different nuances between a new build and a renovation so as we go through the deck we'll probably tic tac between the different types and particularly in renovation there could be a very I suppose light cosmetic upgrade to a bathroom or a very deep renovation where you effectively strip everything back and have a bit more flexibility around moving the position of existing waste etc correct yeah. and and really break those eggs to make yeah, the perfect yeah, omelette yeah absolutely okay so first fixed considerations when you're planning the space so if it's a wet room is it going to have a flush shower access or a low level access tray um, so height wise low level access yeah low level trays now i suppose the standard the standard tray originally was an 80 mil profile that then reduced to 40 mil there's now products on the market and there's products available in the sunnis collection that measure at 30 mil uh, profile so if that's installed flat to floor it has a very small lip step up into the tray and uh, for a lot of applications now clients choose to actually build the floor and the tray to the same level so the tray is effectively recessed into position so it's level with the finished tile and so again, when you're walking in off it, so it's when you're walking level. in it's giving you the full effect of a wet room aesthetically and you know from the point of view of no step but you're still installing a product in a conventional plumbing arrangement. So you don't necessarily need to worry about tanking and waterproofing the entire floor. Um, you mentioned tanking, what's that? So tanking is like a liquid membrane that gets painted all around the floors and up the walls. And that provides a waterproof seal within the bathroom before you can lay your tiles. So probably more pertinent for an upstairs bathroom, uh, less so for downstairs, but probably still best practice to, to So like a double layer of protection of waterproofing? Basically, yeah. Brilliant, yeah. okay. And then um, heated towel rails, I know you and I fall out about this and we have a bit of banter about it, but heated towel rails, can I heat my whole bathroom with them? No, not necessarily. So again, it's really important as part of the design that you understand the heating requirements for the space and that will be driven by a number of factors. So you will hear maybe um, this phrase called a BTU, which is a British thermal unit, and that effectively will vary from one room to another, depending on the size, volumetrics, how many windows, etc. So from Sunna's perspective, we would always guide customers that a heated towel rail is an additional supplement 
to other sources of heat within the bathroom and effectively they are for warming your towels so they shouldn't be treated as the single source of heat. Okay, so under floor heating maybe and yeah. maybe an additional radiator depending Precisely. on BTUs. Yeah, yeah. And you can also download an app, can't you, to calculate the BTUs which helps and you then can. refer to your catalogue? Well, the catalogue will always state what the BTUs are for the individual product. But again, these are considerations that I would always encourage people to consult with professional uh, qualified plumbers and heating engineers because these are not decisions you want to get wrong by going off on a, maybe a solar run thinking you've got enough heat uh, for, the, for the bathroom and you may not. So. And ventilation, of course, is another thing. With new builds, it's probably not as important. But with retrofits, or when we're doing them up, we often see, you know, the mildew on the ceilings and the paint falling off. And it might be just that it's not ventilated, that the window is the only source of ventilation. So that's something to really consider at first fix, isn't yeah, it? It certainly is. I suppose that falls into your services, and that's probably something that people need to think about. Is I suppose the full complement of services. Uh, but yeah, ventilation is really, really critical, and particularly for warranties around bathroom furniture, for example. Um, you have to have proper ventilation. Uh, so you can't beat a, a window that you can open, but there's obviously uh, there's other alternatives to that then as well. So. And finally, for the first fix, we have to consider where to put our shower controls, or do we need to know that as well? Yeah, I suppose the first fix piece, from my perspective, it's really about high-level decisions early in the process. Um, if you were to take a look at, say, some practical examples around product, so if you were thinking about you know, furniture, what type of furniture do you want to have in your bathroom? Do you want it to be wall hung? So again, that's a very high level decision that you should be making early in the process because the wall will need sufficient grounds or sufficient supports to be able to take the weight of the product. And of course, the waste pipes for you know, to take the waste away, they need to be chased up through the wall. So again, if you're doing, say, a, a, a deep renovation, it's very easy to, to, to move pipes that are coming up through the floor into the wall but you should be having these decisions early in the process, communicating it to the builder or the installer, because if he leaves the pipes where they are, and then you come along and make a decision late in the stage that you want wall hung furniture, you're effectively paying to have the, the same work done twice. So having early decisions around first fixed considerations is really important. And I think the last one that we probably should touch on is just the niches in the showers or whatever, well, you, if you're putting you, them in. You, you love the niches in the showers. Before we come to that one, I suppose another first fixed consideration is again on toilets. So there's a growing trend towards wall hung products. Um, you know, lots of benefits in terms of having the product up off the floor, gives a bigger illusion of space. From a hygiene and maintenance point of view, you can wash and mop the floor without touching any of the products. But again, you need to think about this early in the process. So provision needs to be made, you know, and often a void would need to be created inside the bathroom to enable a frame and all the flushing mechanisms and all the, I suppose, the kit, the engine that supports the pan, all has to be, you know, provided for before the pan goes onto the wall. And just seeing the wall hung toilet there, I know some clients of mine are always very aware and weary of going for a wall hung toilet. Um, if they're a larger build or, you know, how does it support weight wise? Yeah, well, the frames that we would supply to support a wall hung pan are steel frames and they can take a weight capacity up to 400 kilos. But again, that's only when the, when the product is installed and grounded in correctly. Uh, but once, once everything is installed as it should be, yeah, you can take up to 400 kgs, which is a significant weight capacity. Um, just in terms of you know, toilets and, and other considerations, if wall hung isn't an option for you and you need to go for a floor mounted toilet, again, the fully shrouded option that you see on the visual here is a really nice solution because again, I suppose high level, most people want to achieve clean lines, you know, minimal design, no fuss, and the fully shrouded toilet gives an opportunity to hide all of the pipe work and the waste. So you mean the lovely pipe. puzzle behind the toilet that we have to get in and try and clean and no. pipes and everything is no longer That's there? That's a thing of the past, yeah. <laughs> there are still some options for open back WCs in certain applications where pipes maybe are running left or right, but in the vast majority of cases, if the waste pipe is running out the wall or even down through the floor, the fully shrouded option is definitely the so way to So is go. a fully shrouded an option with um, retrofit or redoing Yeah, it bathrooms? is. And again, what you need to be, need to be mindful of is where, where is the existing waste pipe running? If it's running out uh, horizontally out through the wall, you have no issue. If it's down through the floor, you really need to get a measurement from the wall to the center of the waste outlet because there are different capacities at the back of the pan in terms of outlet position. Uh, one probably scenario that might be challenging for some clients on a refurb, maybe the downstairs toilet where the, 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 the multi-wick is running into a concrete floor. Often that's probably, if the house is maybe 15, 20 years old, that might be a low level toilet. So the positioning of that 
uh, waste pipe might be quite, quite far stepped out into the room. There are some solutions that we have, um, but again, understanding that measurement is really important. So again, the more planning and you know, proper provisions that are made in the process, the easier this will be. Um, again, just when we're on the subject of toilets, rimless design is another trend that we see uh, from a hygiene point of view. There's nowhere for you know, the, the, the germs to build so up. So it and, does what it says in the sense that you, you don't yeah. have you know, where your little duck or whatever goes in to clean is no to longer toilet there? Toilet duck would be thing of the past because there's no hard areas to reach now. So fully accessible, uh, fully finished ceramic all the way around the pan. Uh, so yeah, rimless design technology. And it's migrated from hospital environments and healthcare environments where infection control was a priority. That's now moved into domestic bathrooms. So again, clients may not even realise it's a rimless design until you point it out. But certainly, as a, you know, once you've had the product installed and you're living with it, it's much easier to maintain and keep it clean. So you would ask about the niches in the shower and all of that. So um, from the point of view of showering, another high level decision that we would advise is around will you want your shower to be exposed which means it's surface mounted on the finished tile wall or is it concealed which means it's built in behind the wall before the finished tile and again either or there's no right or wrong it's very much about what the client's requirements are there's probably some more flexibility around the concealed shower in terms of how you can configure it to suit your needs um, and obviously from a, a, an exposed point of view, the shower that's surface mounted is probably an easier one for the plumber because you can just leave two pipes sticking from the wall and then you can choose after the fact which model you want to install. But again, it's a high level decision that we would encourage people to have thought through before they commence the work. And I know there's three options there, two of which have handheld ones. Um, you and I have had the chats before about this. What's the downfall of not having a handheld shower? Yeah, so if you look at the image on the left-hand side, which is a very clean, minimalist, minimalist finish with a, with a head, a shower head and a built-in shower valve. But there's a practicality element when it comes to showering as well. So having a hand shower. Uh, where you can actually wash the shower down, maybe wash the you know, children, you know, the dog, the dog, whatever. <laughs> if you want to have a shower at washing your hair, so for some maybe females, they may want to have that option. Um, I've made this mistake myself. Uh, so when it comes to cleaning the shower at home, it's, uh, it's a real pain point. It's, it becomes a domestic and it's now my problem because my wife insisted we go for a hand shower and I refused to do so because I knew best. So again, that's just something I've learned from mistakes. So the image on the right hand side, with, which shows the exposed valve, uh, that's a very popular choice now for clients because it gives you the multifunction. You've got the benefit of the rain head and then you've got the flexibility of the hand shower as well. And actually on that we probably should touch about rain heads as well, that they give that lovely slow drenching rain effect, they don't take the skin off you. So people generally think, I know I've had clients in the past and I think we've talked about it too, where the rain head they think it's actually going to gush down on them, it's going to be a massive quantity of water, but it is actually the opposite isn't it? Yeah, it's generally, I suppose, the, the power you get from the shower will be driven by a number of parameters and one is that, you know, how powerful is the pressurised system, you know, if you have a shower pump what bar pressure is that running at so there's a number of things there to begin with but generally speaking the rule of thumb is the smaller the surface area the more powerful the flow will feel so if it's a large drench head or rain head you will get a volume of water and you get a really nice showering experience but if you want that really powerful power shower experience then having a smaller head smaller hand shower will give you that option. And you have another option as well, don't you, for a really powerful body shower, do you have little body jets? Like yeah, there's a, again, there's an additional uh, specification you can add in. So again, if you look at the image in the middle, you can see here there's a lot of flexibility in the way this shower has been designed. So because you've got built-in controls, you can have your shower, on, shower head on one wall, you can have your actual shower controls on another, and then you can add in body jets as well. So depending on how many diverters are built into the shower, you can run multiple outlets. And again, you'd need to know that before first fix. Yeah, and I think that's a really nice illustration of the niche that you were referring to. So from your designer experience, this has become very much, it's a, it's a necessity for everybody, I think. Absolutely, yeah, and I would always say tile the bottom with one tile so that you just give one wipe, that it's not mosaiced or something in the bottom. Um, we do them all the time as standard. And if you consider them at first type fix, you never have to think about it again. If you add it in afterwards, it generally becomes more expensive and more cumbersome so we get 
get to the stage sometimes where people are starting to tile and they want to niche them, then it's it's almost too late or it's quite prohibitive costly yeah. to do yeah. it. So. Well, you're paying, again, you're paying for the same work to be done twice. Yeah, and I, again, I would say to people, measure the bottles that you use because mm -hmm. they change. People have different bottles and I know you're not necessarily going to stay with the same ones. But if you use a brand that comes in a much taller bottle than normal, make sure that the niche is tall mm -hmm. enough to house that bottle as well. Otherwise, it's pointless. Yeah. Good advice. Uh, we touched on the wet room versus the shower tray and again there's no right or wrong it very much comes down to client requirements uh, from Sunnis bathrooms perspective we sell a lot of shower trays and the two illustrations that we've shown on the, the slide right now is from our slate collection which is a slate effect tray it's a gel coat finish so it has a slip resistance uh, built into the tray as opposed to on the kind of traditional low profile trays which have an acrylic cap they tend to be a little bit more slippy, but you can have an, an aftermarket so you can add on a, a slip resistance. And do we do that at ordering? We, or? can, we can do that for you at ordering stage, yeah. It can be done at factory or it can be done at, at Sunnis HQ as well. This particular product, the slate effect tray, the material itself, because it's a different material, it has that inherent property. And it also gives you the opportunity to add colour and texture, which is very much on trend as well. So we're showing two different colour options here. There's four in total. And we're also illustrating a flat to floor application versus a recessed. So you can see here, you can achieve the wet room look, but just have a conventional installation and a 90 mil plumbing waste. So from a plumber's perspective, it's no different to installing a normal shower tray, but because it's so low profile, it doesn't have a big step up in. So it gives you the nice aesthetic that people want to achieve. And the plain glass panel is great as well because it gives a bit of deflection for the water, I think. I find a lot of clients where they put in wet rooms and then subsequently they, they realise that it is what it says on the tin. Yeah. It's wet. Yeah. Um, and they decide that the glass just gives them that little bit of a deflection and it's illustrated well there with the vanity unit that it's not going everywhere, that it's kind of containing the water a little bit. Yeah, for sure. And there's lots of flexibility around those panels and you can really design and configure to suit your needs. Probably the starting point is to agree what's the, what's the platform, what's the space you're allocating to the showering area. And once you know what that is, you then can configure either a front panel or a front and end panel, depending on how much protection you want. Uh, some, maybe some thermal insulation as well, because again, if you're showering in an open space, you know, while you've got hot water, running over you, you still have the kind of the ambient temperature in the room as well. So from a comfort perspective, some people like to have a little bit more of an enclosure. And that's why even with a shower enclosure, you know, some, some clients still prefer to have that close the door behind them, keeps all the steam and the hot water inside. It's probably a bit more comfortable uh, of an experience. So getting back to your uh, process when you go through this with a client, so just to kind of summarise the various pieces you're looking at for the shower. Um, well, obviously the trays that we've touched on are really important for me. I, I generally try and get it as flat as possible for obvious reasons. And then the screen, I would always tell people to spend a lot of money on the screen. I think it's one of those things that warrants a really high spend as maybe if budgets are tight and they're trying to cut back on some things, it's something I would really advocate for them not to cut back on. I think if they're doing the door, there's nothing nicer than the clunk, whichever way it's closing, but that good quality clunk, it's something you're going to use every day, maybe twice a day for its length of life, so I think it's really worth it. Um, the shower heads, as we touched on, the controls, but I would also say to people, when you're picking the head and picking the controls, and I know your staff are really good at that, make sure it all matches with the taps, and if it's all square that you're going for this, sometimes you walk into a bathroom and maybe you might not know why it doesn't work. Um, like you picked everything the same as the magazine and it should work but it doesn't but it's just those little details that don't marry up so it's trying to marry those details throughout yeah. and that the, the whole feel and look of the yeah. space is the so same. So if it's a round shower head maybe going for a round tap head you know if there's soft square design just making sure that there's a complement in the aesthetic sometimes people can pick a traditional tap because they like the look of it on the freestanding bath and then they've got a contemporary tap on the basin and it just it jars a little bit. So again, when you come to the Sunnis showroom, our advisors will take you through that process and it's some of that finer detail that we'd be guiding people on just because the finished results you just want it to all hang together. And Absolutely, look, look as, and even as well the, as the handles on the vanity units and whatever, just that all those little details all pull together and that's yeah. what elevates the design, I think. For sure. Bath or no bath, fight of the century. So I have clients constantly saying I have to have a bath. But then I ask why, well, I lose the value in the house if it's going to be sold. Um, 
are you going to sell the house anytime soon? No, I'm just building it. It's my dream home. I'm, it's going to be my forever home or I'm renovating it or whatever. I'm not going to be selling it for 20 years. I wouldn't worry about that. Um, they end up being in this tiny little shower enclosure, maybe 900 by 900, which we know is 300 bigger than the standard one years ago, but it's still small where they can get rid of the bath and they can have a really decent shower and a really lovely experience and then possibly use the bath once a year. You'll get other clients who use the bath every day um, and they want to shower. They might end up with the shower in the bath and various options, but it's really about thinking how you as your family use the space that you're in. Yeah, really important, yeah. And again, the there is that killer question of will it affect the value of my property i have read some research about property valuations when there's no bath in the house i think from what i can understand it really comes down to the buyer audience and if you have no bath in your house you may reduce the audience that would potentially buy the house and what i mean by that is if you've got a three bed maybe like a starter family home and you take out the bath you know, effectively you're going to narrow your audience because there's in all likelihood there's maybe another family with children may want to buy that property. So it's just to think about that, but you're dead right. It's really who's going to use the space, not just now, but in the future. How do you currently use your bathroom? What are your current requirements? And if you start with that in terms of usage, you know, it's a good way of mapping out what will get most value from the new the new bathroom and investment. And the freestanding bath as well, and the, the deck mounted taps, they all need to be considered in first yeah. fix as well. It's too late coming in at Yeah, for sure. If you, if you were to look at the image on the right hand side, which has that beautiful black freestanding bath shower mixer, that is very much a first fix product. So there's a particular anchor that goes into the floor pre-tiling. And again, sometimes clients will have the floor tiles and then they've opted they want to have a freestanding bath. At that stage, you're going to have to go. Again, it's all about avoiding going back to pay to have the same work done twice. So think about these things early on in the process and you'll avoid that. For clients that don't have an option to have, like the ideal scenario is a bath and a shower. If clients don't have that option, there are particular baths called shower baths and they come in different shapes, which effectively gives you, I suppose, a, a hybrid uh, solution. So you have the, the functionality of the bath, but it has an enlarged standing area and a reinforced base and a dedicated screen. So you can effectively have a shower within the bath because a standard bath for bathing in technically is not really designed for you to stand in, although clients do, uh, they do follow that, but it's not ideal in, 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 from a starting position. That's just a, a kind of a clearer illustration of uh, what the shower bath may look like. So sanitary way of going. Yes, yeah, so we have pedestals, sinks and vanity units. I would, um, again, be a huge advocate of storage everywhere. You can never have enough. So vanity units all the way for me. Uh, vanity units with drawers, even more important, I think. Uh, wall hung ones, so you can see under, and that illustration earlier on showed beautifully how you can really see under the one versus the one you can't, and why the space looks bigger. Um, and then what you're going to do with the vanity unit, which sounds a bit mad, but uh, you know, are you going to put on your makeup? Do you need a flat space either side of the sink to do it? Are you going to shave maybe at it? You know, so how you use that space and whether you're choosing yeah. a vanity or a sink for that. Yeah. And of course, lighting and storage, you've kind of touched on, but these are probably really big decisions that people need to think about. Hugely, yeah, lighting. You know, I like that if you're going to be at your vanity unit and you're going to be shaving or you're going to be um, putting on makeup, there's nothing worse than putting on makeup, thinking it's all beautifully blended, going out to a restaurant and realising that you have this lovely line around your face that you didn't get rid of because the light wasn't good enough. So you need this really bright white light. But then what happens if Is you're lying in the bath? Is that what you refer bath? to as task lighting? Yes, yeah. yeah. And then if you're lying in the bath, though, you don't want that. So ambient lighting would be just a general light across the whole area. Mm -hmm. Ambiance is where I want to lie in my bath and relax and have that lovely kind of orange glow or candlelight, but I don't want this mad, luminous mm. uh, white LED light. So spots are tunable now. Um, they were about €250 Euro a spot to go up and down the Kelvin scale as little as maybe three years ago. What's the Kelvin scale? It's the lighting scale, so it's how we measure measure light and the, the temperature of light um, and now you can buy them uh controllable by your mobile for 25 euro okay. uh, so you can sit in your bath well hopefully not with your phone but you can sit in the bath and control it and um, so that's that's really important to have that controllable lighting okay. um, and then storage we talked about the built-in storage and the niches um, and shelving as well and you have some lovely long units which are great they're maybe 300 wide and they're a really good uh, um, addition to bathrooms because they store so mm. much but they can look really really well placed mm. and you can build them in you have some built-in we've, we've actually in done the showroom 
just to demonstrate that clients as well. So again, thinking about if you don't want the storage column to protrude too much into the bathroom or take up too much space, by creating a niche specifically for it, you can actually go and counter sink it into the wall. So again, loads of things possible, as long as it's planned and prepared for. Accessories then is probably something that's very much an afterthought and certainly as a, a supplier of the full suite of products we see this ourselves with clients where the big ticket items are very much given consideration and then it's nearly after the fact people are running down to the local DIY or B&Q to pick up some accessories but it's something that probably should be thought about uh, particularly when it comes to future proofing and you know supports and stuff like that. Absolutely yeah and you know even things like the mirror that you're going to be doing your makeup or your shaving in if you're putting a demister in you need to have considered uh, electrics at first fix as well and um, grab rails and things like that you know you might want to put in some grounds in for them at the start so that you're future proofing if anybody ever needs yeah, additional yeah. help yeah very good so just on that we spoke about future proofing and uh, i suppose this is just gives some illustration of what we mean by that so again if you think about who's going to use the bathroom any particular needs that they may have but potentially what needs you may have into the future because bear in mind a bathroom renovation it could be 10 to 20 years before you tackle that renovation again so you, you don't just think about how you are now but potentially what requirements you might have in the future so things like anti scald products thermostatically controlled products from a safety aspect very important if you've got young children in the house you know the risk of scalding from hot water so there's lots of solutions you can have you can have thermostatic controls on the supply side underneath the bath which will regulate temperature obviously for shower valves and shower controls again to make sure that they have those safety standards built in and um, but there's other things that you've considered as well from a universal design point of view and you've got a nice illustration here of a wall hung wc and then maybe a, an older variant of that when somebody had some requirements for support on the legs absolutely and those requirements could come from you know going outside and tripping down a pavement and breaking something they don't necessarily have to come from being old or mm -hmm. from acquiring some illness and um, so we i know you sell comfort height toilets which we hadn't mentioned mm -hmm. as well so they're brilliant what yeah. height is a comfort height toilet a comfort height toilet would be 450 mil approximately from the floor to the rim of the pan and that's 50 mil higher than a standard wc would be so again it just gives you that extra height it's easier to access on and off to the pan and people without injuries can use them as well and i think all our med all our measurements that we use are from anthropological data that we got back in the 50s you know we're now 70 years past that we've grown a lot yeah. like you know our average height has grown a lot and yet we're still using those smaller products yeah. so again i think the comfort height is brilliant and um, i would I, I think anybody i've said it to has gone for it because it actually is more yeah. comfortable um, you might have a little issue with little kids but again they have an issue anyway so you deal with it with the little steps yeah, or whatever sure. and then you can put in grounds like hard fixings for um, any additional needs that you need that can yeah. be added in later yeah. yeah and again just picking up on the, the the image in the center with the tap again if there's any mobility or dexterity issues for users again having a tap that you can operate with a clenched fist far, far easier than maybe something that has a round control with no lever again wet hands think of that in the shower particularly where your hands are wet and soapy and if you've got a nice round control it can sometimes be a little bit slippy and more difficult to operate whereas if you opt for something with a lever or something that you can get some porches onto it's much easier to operate and the lever nowadays as well COVID, yeah yeah know. well again <laughs> that's a whole other conversation <laughs> yeah so again that's just a, a probably a bigger a bigger illustration of the, the thing what, what what's your point here when it comes to the, the the putting in the hard spots for the supports so I suppose I, I always design for uh, with universal design in, in mind and it's about designing for everybody, tall people, small people, left-handed, right-handed, you name it, everybody. But it's also for future-proofing if somebody did have an additional needs. That horrendous image on the left, whoever's poor home that is versus the one on the right they both do exactly the same thing you could argue that the one on the right doesn't actually have two supports but it's easy to put a second one in but that's the difference that's what you're looking at so you don't need all the extra paraphernalia and it means everybody can use it and the person that has those additional needs doesn't feel like they're impeding on everybody mm -hmm. and of course with the wall hung solution the frames that go in behind the wall they can be set to the height that you require that so you can have a standard height wall hung pan or you can have a comfort height wall hung pan as well and that's all achievable with just flexibility within the frame so just specify that with the plumber just specify before, they start. before tiling and before all that's finished yeah so we spoke about who will use the space and again i think this kind of nicely captures you know the variety of bathroom users and different people at different stages of life have different needs so this is a really nice illustration just to kind of 
show people there's so, so much variety in terms of who's going to use the bathroom, different ages in life, different requirements. So again, I suppose our, our overarching advice when it comes to planning the bathroom is to really think about who's going to use the space, what the needs are, how you want it to look. Are there any other considerations you may want to think about? Yeah, and I suppose I had one client who saw a beautiful illustration in a magazine where there was all big, beautiful white stones around a bath, and she had two little kids, and I was saying to her, are you going to bath the kids? Yes, yes, and it's going to be beautiful. I said, you're going to be on your knees bathing them. Of course. Not going to work. Yeah. She hadn't thought about yeah. it, you know, so it's really thinking about how you're, you're using the space, really thinking about how you're using it. And then, of course, how you want it to feel. Mm. So lots of clients would Explain have... Explain that, Gwen. So what do you mean by how you want it to feel? So people, I hate Pinterest, but people will come on with Pinterest ideas going, this is what I want. Mm. Forget that. Just go back to how you want it to feel. Mm. So do you want it to be like spa-like? Do you want it to be cosy? Do you want it to be sterile and bright mm. and smart? You know, more about the feeling that you want in. It. and after that then you can add in the look and how it's going to how you're going to achieve that but when you walk into your bathroom are you going to have a bath in it is it going to be lovely and warm and relaxing or do you want it to be that bright maybe biophilic loads of greenery or whatever it is so the feeling is really important and then you know what you're achieve, trying to achieve yeah when you think of all the different product solutions that are available you can have everything from contemporary to traditional to victorian so it's really about just getting that blend of decor and the equipment that you select as well and that will bring the finished product all together absolutely um, i suppose budgets are always going to be a consideration for people and look how long is a piece of string there's so many options but in terms of planning you know do you need to have a contingency when you plan out your budget Yes, yes, always, 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 always. It's your money at the end of the day. It's not like somebody's taking the contingency and going, it's mine. It's it's the client's money, but it's just about reinforcing yeah. some money, especially if it's a retrofit. Mm -hmm. Because nine times out of 10, yeah. um, you find when you pull out the old bathroom, like you can nearly smell it and yeah. it, you know, there's damp somewhere. Yeah. Um, something's got to be dealt with. And yeah. so you just need to have that bit of contingency yeah. to be able to do it. I think it's good advice. And again, I would always say to people when it comes to planning a bathroom, Bathroom, always seek professional advice you know from a qualified installer particularly people who specialize if it's a refurbishment in that whole process because there's lots of trades to bring together from you know there's carpentry there's electrics there's tiling there's plumbing uh, and if you're trying to manage all of that project yourself it can be quite stressful whereas having somebody who can provide end-to-end -end solution is really helpful there are some hidden costs again and probably more pertinent on a refurb but again we spoke about the power shower so if you're taking out you know, the oil shower, putting in a new power shower with a pump, your cylinder, your hot water cylinder that's in the, the hot press may not be big enough, may not have enough hot water capacity, so you may have to upgrade. When tiles come off the wall and they get back to the bare floor, sometimes they need to be replaced. Electrics may need to be upgraded. So there's a whole raft of kind of potential issues that you may not have considered after you've, you know, you've gone and you've picked out all the products from the catalogue and you've priced it up. So you really need to think about those hidden costs and have that contingency built in. Uh, but I think a professional survey to begin with, and you know this from your design experience, again, if you get that advice at the start, it should mitigate against some of these unforeseen things. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. yeah for sure. Uh, in terms of common mistakes, you know, you've probably seen them all from being in, in clients' homes over the years. Avocado, uh, brown, no yeah, only joking. Yeah, yeah, well, they're coming back now, so just watch out for the colours. Yeah, they're definitely on their way back. But I think things like ventilation, we've touched on the services. You know, so inadequate ventilation is a real problem. Uh, the lack of storage, you know, absolute no-no. And you can see there's probably a poor example, you know, in terms of all of the material that's sitting around the wash basin. But again, there's so many storage solutions now and people want all of that hidden. They don't want to have it on show. So making sure you provide for that. And then layout, that would certainly be a strong set for you in terms of looking at the space that you have and reconfiguring it. And you've even mentioned about nicking space from maybe an adjoining bedroom to give yourself more space, more usable space in the bathroom. So again, there's loads of things possible providing they're planned for and you seek the proper advice. Absolutely. Okay.